farm, family, community. This is Midwest Farm Weekly. Good morning, I'm Melaine Wells and welcome to Midwest Farm Weekly. On the show today, Wisconsin loves to make cheese and there are some new award winners to celebrate. Plus becoming a rainfall reporter, how your data can help our weather team. And our farm family features sisters on a mission to connect with local families and animals. We have details on their new rescue in De Pere. Milk production is on the rise in our state. Wisconsin cows made 2.71 billion pounds of milk in January. That's an increase of 2% year over year. The Badger State is home to roughly 1.3 million head, a total herd number that is down compared to January of 2022. Now, in order to grow output while losing cows, that means animals are making more milk. The average cow in our state is up around 40 pounds per month. We have an update on a push for dairy farmers to remove the word milk from non-dairy versions of the beverage. Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin reintroduced the Dairy Pride Act this week. It would prevent imitation dairy products from using dairy terms such as milk, yogurt, or cheese. We're talking about items that are plant-based, everything from nuts to seeds. The bill would override the recent FDA draft recommendations saying plant-based dairy alternatives such as those made from almonds, oats, and soy milk can in fact be labeled as milk as long as they clearly identify their plant source. The guidance calls for voluntary labels that reveal if the drink has fewer nutrients than dairy milk. Almond milk is the most popular plant-based milk in the U.S., though the popularity of oak, oat milk, that is, has grown the fastest. People looking to learn more about the meat industry can have some of their schooling paid for by the state. This tuition reimbursement is part of a $5 million program designed to connect the meat processing industry to potential employees. I spoke with Wisconsin's Ag Secretary about who should apply. We realize that while we want to nurture uh, the interest in a livestock and meat processing career in Wisconsin, and we do that by in, in, uh, creating a high school curriculum and, and getting people interested in the tech colleges, we also realize that there are a lot of people who work in the industry right now as their career, and it's, it's our responsibility to work with them to uh, educate while we regulate. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing tuition reimbursement for people who are currently in the industry uh, and want to go back and just kind of fine tune their skills a little bit. And so the University of Wisconsin-Madison is one of our partners. They've got that great facility down there that's a great learning uh, environment. And so we're, we're doing tuition assistance for the people who want to go through that. The great thing about a lot of these programs that we've developed through the Meat Talent Development Program is it can be a la carte. I mean, if you want to get a four-year degree, you can. If you want to get a two-year degree, you can. And if, that, if that's what you need to get in the industry, those are available. But especially working with UW uh, and the technical college system, we've also got partnerships with Brewer Falls and Platteville, they can, people can get into the programs and they can just take one or two or three courses that they need to get their start in the industry and off they go. We have full details on signing up for this tuition reimbursement on wearegreenbay.com. Head to the Midwest Farm section, which is under the News tab. Wisconsin egg production is starting to rise when you compare month to month. However, production remains down around 16% from last year. As for prices, a new report from the USDA predicts the cost of eggs will fall nearly 27% this year. The U.S. Department of Ag says it does not see a rebound in outbreaks of bird flu. Wisconsin trout producers say their industry continues to grow in our state. According to a new report from the USDA, trout sales topped $1.7 billion last year in the Badger State. That's a jump of 3% annually. The value of fish is also on the rise, up around 4% year over year. In addition to food sales, trout are also purchased for conservation purposes. This week, the Midwest Manure Summit returned to Lambeau Field. The goal is to showcase new technology and research for farmers to make the most of their manure. I spoke with a bio-waste engineer about the several reasons why a producer might want to change up their manure handling system. Uh, one, you might try to improve your economics. Uh, it's a large part of our operational costs. 
Uh, two, you might want to try to prove your environmental outcomes. So that's really driving a lot of the industry lately. I see a lot of industry partners wanting to see some development in that area. So there's a lot of reasons that you might want to improve that. And sometimes they come together that you might be able to make some more money because you're improving some in, uh, environmental indicators. And so here we're trying to provi provide all those in that information. We've had a heavy focus this year, I think, on trying to look at renewable energy systems. So there's a lot of information that have been provided for, we've had digesters for a long time, but having a lot of uh, information on how you might want to use the biogas differently, how that might impact your uh, bottom line, how that might impact the products you're making. And so a lot of different information just to kind of look at so that people can make hopefully science-based choices on what maybe their next steps in their in their system might be. Wisconsin won more awards than any other state during the U.S. Championship Cheese Contest. Wisconsin cheesemakers secured almost half of the 20 finalist honors. Red Barn Family Farms from Appleton was named second best cheese in the country. Wisconsin cheesemakers further showcased their award-winning craftsmanship, sweeping 28 competition classes. The overall champion cheese is made in Connecticut, but it also has ties to the Badger State. The cheesemaker, Eric Schmidt, was born and raised in southern Wisconsin. I don't know what to say. Um, this, this is a, a great honor to have. Um, and I, I, I duly appreciate everyone who has entered this competition and at World Cheese Contest, too. You know, it's a great, it's a great, uh, you know, it's a great, uh, it's a great thing we got going on. Wisconsin Cheese and Dairy Companies earned 171 total awards, and that includes 51 best of class. Though Wisconsin is still a few months away from pick your own, it is strawberry season in Tampa Bay, Florida, and one winery is taking things to the next level by making wine out of that sweet red fruit. It's no secret how tasty these ruby reds are. Strawberries are amazing. It's such a great fruit. They're yummy eating them as is, but to think about strawberries in wine form, don't even get me started. It's a very special uh, part of Plant City and the history and tradition of the city. So it's great to, to be able to make wine with it. Clay Keel's father began making wine out of blueberries since about two decades ago. How do I in, include these other fruits? And obviously we're in the winter strawberry capital of the world here in Plant City. So strawberry was on the top of the list to start playing with. It's quite the process. After the fruit is picked, it's washed and cut and then put into a fermenter. This is where sugar and water and yeast are put in. The yeast, that is the key to making the alcohol. After it's put into a press and put back into the fermenter. The liquid is then separated from the solids of the fruit by a machine. The final step is filtering the wine before it's put into a bottle. About half a million bottles of strawberry wine, at least to this point. And over the years, what started off as a single bottle of strawberry Riesling has turned into different flavors, including strawberry shortcake. Sweet wine, but uh, you know people are surprised the strawberry shortcake wine. You actually can taste a little bit of the, the shortcake. It's got some some flavor in there that's bready, and then it's got some vanilla and everything that kind of goes along with the shortcake. If you want a sample? Keel Farms is able to ship its fruit wines to Wisconsin. You can shop on their website. A robot is making winemakers' jobs easier as labor becomes a growing challenge in that industry. This unit is being tested at a South Australian vineyard. The robot is controlled through a phone app, and while it's only cutting grass for now, the bot is set to become a fundamental part of staffing at the vineyard across this nation and ours, with many more uses yet to be trialed. Basically testing the technology to see that it can follow a path um, at the moment, and then once we've successfully slashed, we'll then consider what we can do with it. But there's plenty of other trailed and um, vehicle-mounted operations that we do that we look forward to trialling over the next three years. And stateside, a pilot program in California is using a robot to pick grapes. The new technology reduces the need for more manual labor, but it also creates new high-wage jobs as people are needed to maintain the robots. The team of scientists at UC Davis says there is also a surprising benefit. Their research shows mechanically maintained crops come out better tasting. Still to come on Midwest Farm Weekly, they've never ridden horses before, but now these sisters are raising them. We're going to take a look at their unique path to becoming caretakers. Welcome back. A program headquartered in Maryland is doing its part to keep farming culture alive in minority communities, and the work is creating a new generation of growers across the country. Skylar Henry explains how the Alliance of Farmers is getting back to their roots. 
<laughs> this group of ladies may be small. Sisters are all for one and one for all. <laughs> but they run this large four acre farm just outside of Washington, D.C., where crops are coming and more importantly for the group, so are an abundance of seeds. What happened was people stopped saving seeds and every year the price of seeds go up and every year it's harder and harder to get the seeds you want. Bonita Adib runs the Ujama Cooperative Farming Alliance under the nonprofit Steam Onward, bringing together black and indigenous farmers in and around Maryland and the initiative has gained national recognition. We love watermelon, we love okra, we love sorghum, you know, uh, all those things that are important to our ancestors, that's, that's what we love and that's what we grow. Across the nation, less than 1% of farms are black owned, which limits minorities' access to the $15 billion seed growing industry. Adib rolled up her sleeves once she and her team recognized the need to promote minority representation in the agriculture space. They also address what she says is a lack of access to natural unfertilized food. Ujama's progress is growing dividends. Their online seed catalog doubled in the last year and contains just about every seed you can think of, from squash to corn to quinoa. It's all there. The work is building a network of farmers with a range of experience. What's your biggest takeaway from doing this work? It's a sense of community, sense of seeing how others are working in their community. And there are thousands and thousands of us out there. And the only way we can beat any type of obstacle is to work together and work through it. Bridging a gap of culture and connecting a new generation of growers. Ujama Seeds just launched their second online catalog. Just last year, the group had nearly 1,000 seed orders across the country. We often feature farm families who've grown up living the lifestyle, but today we meet a pair of sisters in De Pere who are growing their love of agriculture one day at a time. So this is Whistler's Run and Rescue. We are a 42-acre horse farm uh, rescue sanctuary and private venue. We exist to hopefully motivate others to want to protect and advocate for animals and children, and we hope to do that through in-person experiences that are both educational and entertaining. Um, it was, I was on the brink of retiring. I sold a company and decided I didn't want to be in the corporate world anymore, and so um, this farm came up and it was very close to um, our house, and we looked at it. At first I was overwhelmed by the size, but then I thought, you know, what, what a better time in life. We're in our 40s, we can do it, and it's just been the most fun and we were able to take a look at our lives and say, what do we care about? And both of us love animals and we love children. We both have um, psychology and education and occupational therapy backgrounds. So this really just marries very well with that, educating the public and um, spending time with those that we love. Um, we have heated stalls, the floors are heated. Um, there's 19 boarding stalls here. I somehow have filled um, about half of those stalls with my own horses since May. I didn't own any in May, now I own nine. Um, so. But yeah, they're, they're beautiful stalls, they're spacious, we, we keep the animals um, comfortable and give them the life that we think they deserve. We're learning to care for these animals and we're learning um, a lot about what we want to do in terms of impacting the world and how animals are viewed and seen. Um, one example would be we have a rescue here who was starved for the last three years of her life. So if you walk up to her when she's trying to eat, she will nip at you. She had to fight for her food. A lot of people look at that and think, what a misbehaved animal. She's not. She needs patience she needs understanding and that really translates to human beings as well. We're really excited for some of our summer programming so we plan to have sunrise and sunset yoga with the animals. We're gonna have homesteading classes in which you could make a tincture or an herb garden. We'll have kids camps in which kids can become stewards of the land and caretakers of animals and we're most excited about bringing the uh, concept of a pizza farm to the area. So you and your family would come you'd bring a blanket or some lawn chairs we will have live music we will have local food and drinks you can interact with the animals you can take a hike on our flat, beautiful, mile and a half long trail um, and just enjoy a really memorable, wholesome evening with the whole family. This has been a trial by fire, <laughs> but um, we love it. I wouldn't change it for anything, but just, um, you know, they all really have their own personalities and they're, they're not like dogs. I remember thinking that when I started, well, this couldn't be much different than owning a dog, but um, they're all individual. They all do their own thing. They all have preferences and, you know, we're just here to really honor those. And even since my visit, the resident count at Whistler's Run grew substantially. They now have 
calves, mini horses, goats, and plenty more socializing with visitors. Whistler's Run and Rescue is located about 15 minutes from downtown De Pere. In the future, in addition to all of their special events, they plan to offer horse riding lessons as well. Parts of the country experienced severe weather this past week. In Indiana, Mother Nature took aim at an agriculture landmark. Here is Nick McGill with a look at the impact. It's easy to look at a barn as nothing more than the sum of its parts. It's amazing how many people live within five to ten miles and never been in the round barn, but everybody knows it. But for the Kingan family, this red, round, wooden structure has served as their foundation for generations. The old barn's been there 125 years. You know, it's taken some storms. And now its foundation is in jeopardy. The foundation's really in rough shape, and I don't know what it's going to take. The historic round barn has stood near 600 North for more than 100 years, an iconic landmark in the community. And while it still stands today, for how much longer is unclear. This is really hard. It's, <laughs> it's hard. I grew up here. My dad grew up here. My great-grandpa. Grandpa, it's yesterday after the, well, after the storm hit, we went up there and it was rough. But it is certainly a beautiful structure and to have those sort of winds uh, be able to damage it, certainly uh, it shows the pus what the power of the wind can do. Jason Puma with the National Weather Service says wind speeds reached up to 110 miles per hour. Yet another example of the power severe weather in Indiana can have. We were hollering at each other trying to find out where everybody was and we couldn't. We couldn't hear. We couldn't hear each other yell on top of our lungs. Fortunately, no one in the Kingan family was hurt, but Gary says the round barn and others on the property were severely damaged. Now they're taking stock of what's left behind, adding up the sum of all the parts and hoping those foundations last for another generation. I really thought she would come down last night with the wind we had later on last night, but she's a tough barn. <laughs> she's real tough. Well, do you enjoy monitoring the weather? Your help is always needed as a rainfall reporter. This is a look at the current reporters in our state. They're always on the lookout for more people to share their data. The National Weather Service uses it from observers for assessing drought, flood risk, and precipitation trends. The more reporters, of course, the better the reports are. We have details on applying in the Midwest Farm section of wearegreenbay.com. Click on the News tab to find us from the homepage. All right, we are now into March, so let's recap our February numbers. It really turned out to be a snowy month. We averaged about 25 and a half degrees for our temperature, which makes it the 16th warmest February on record. But you recall the beginning part of the month was exceptionally warm, and then it got really, really snowy at the end. Uh, way up on the liquid precip, over an inch, and for snowfall, 23 and a half inches for snow. Now for the season, 48.1 inches and if you compare that to average we're up about four and a half inches as of uh, this week but you compare it to last year you can see how much more snow we've picked up so far we only had 34 and a half inches at this point in our season a year ago so we are big on the snow and as you see here now going forward over the next 10 days we are expecting additional snow march is not going to be overly warm to begin at least and you can see much of the snow will occur from about Highway 29 and points north. Of course, the lake belts expected to get a lot more. And in general, the northern tier of the upper Midwest and the western Great Lakes will be picking up the majority of the snow. March is a very snowy month. Typically, we pick up around eight inches of snow on average, but sometimes you can get a big wallop because now the storms can garner a lot more moisture as they roll through. In terms of high temperatures, we will be hovering in the upper 30s and low 40s here now as we head through at least this weekend, cooling back down below average. Keep in mind our average highs now hovering in the mid and upper 30s, especially by the time we get to the end of this outlook. So we're running about 8 to 10 degrees underneath average for really the majority of the upcoming week. That will be a trend that I think you'll experience really for much of the beginning part of the new month of March. Across the upper Midwest, we are expecting temperatures to remain at or below average, not only for our neck of the woods, but really for the majority of the lower 48. So even though we are expecting temperatures uh, to stay below average, this is something that really 
can really turn around as we make our way through the end of the month of March because of, as we know, every week that clicks by at this point now is a week that we can really start to turn things around, Melaine. Certainly welcome, though, to see any form of precipitation, especially to the west of us. Yeah, I mean, you know, last year uh, you heard so many stories, California and, and the issues that are having and happening out there. Certainly a good thing that we will add more moisture, not only here, but out there as well. We appreciate the update, and as always, find more ag news on wearegreenbay.com. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.